I just want to spend a couple moments with you this morning to, number one, just give you a recap of what the kids learned and really dig into a scripture this morning that talks about maybe some challenges for us in what we need to learn from this as well. Um, we named our VBS this year a gospel stampede. And uh, this isn't a... One thing that our church has done ever since I've been here is we've always kind of come up with our own themes and our own ideas for how to run Vacation Bible School. And, and that's, that's neat in one, one regard. It's a lot of work in another. But, uh, but nonetheless, we always try to bring scriptural truth into a, a, a way, an illustration that kids can grasp it. Because whether you're a kid or you're an adult, let's just face it, Scripture is sometimes hard to understand. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's nice to have a little illustration. And so we, we try to take that each night and, and give some illustrations about what some of the gospel truths are about. The first night, we, we used a branding iron. I actually had one up here. I don't know where it's at now. Uh, and we, we talked about how when a cowboy goes to brand his cattle, it identifies that cattle as one of his. And in the same way as as people, as we are either going to be identified with Christ or we're not going to be identified with Christ. And we have to decide at some point in our life whether we're going to accept Christ as our Savior and allow, allow Him to really be our brand or not. The second night we talked about, uh, uh, like once you've become a Christian, uh, we, we looked at the example of the saddle. And uh, we've had a lot of saddles up here and some bridles, and we talked about that, about how just because you've taken a wild horse and you've put them in a corral and you've put a brand on them, doesn't mean you can just throw a saddle on the next day and start taking off and making him a useful horse. Uh, no, he needs to do a couple of things. He has to learn to trust in his master, and he has to learn to be trained to do what he, the master wants him to do. And so uh, we talked about the fact that the saddle and the, the bridle are things that God uses, that the cowboy uses to help with the, make the horse useful. And in the same way, we have to, as Christians, once we've accepted Christ, learn to, uh, learn to trust in the Lord every day of our life and learn to be trained by Him by understanding and absorbing God's Word into our life. The third night we talked about uh, the cowboy hat. We've had some, lots of cowboy hats this week. And um, I said, one of the things that you never see a cowboy without is this cowboy hat. What, really, what is a cowboy without a cowboy hat? He's just a guy on a horse, right? You know? <laughs> so you have to have the, you know, he's, it's there. It's a personal thing. It's a, it's a way he identifies. And I said, just the same way that every cowboy has a personal cowboy hat that represents his, his demeanor, I said, we all as Christians need to have a personal life of prayer. We need to have prayer. What is a Christian without a life of prayer? We need that in us. And I talked about how the cowboy hat, number one, protects us from the sun as cowboys. And number two, a lot of, a lot of the kids didn't know this, but back in the Old West, at least, according to Google, um, <laughs> you can trust everything you find on the Internet. You know that. <laughs> the cowboy would... When they got out in the, the desert heat, they would, they would get off the horse and they would find a stream or a pond and they would take their hat and scoop up water with it and give the horse a drink and then they'd get a drink. Hopefully not in that order, but uh, that's what they would do. And, uh, and that was a way that the, the hat was able to be something they could provide sustenance for their horse. Prayer's the same thing for us. Prayer is something that's meant we can ask God for protection through our prayer. We can ask God to provide for us. So we've talked about, we used all these different cowboy illustrations. In the last night, maybe your kids came home and told you about this. Um, we had a bullwhip here with us. And uh, I, don't, I don't have it up here now, but, and that's probably good. Uh, <laughs> we had some of the kids that wanted to test that out on their own last, uh, this, last this week. But uh, we talked about the bullwhip, and uh, we explained some things about it. And really, the bullwhip serves as not a way to whip a horse or to whip a cattle or to even touch them. Bullwhips aren't even supposed to touch your animals. The bullwhip was meant to make a noise to keep them alert, to keep them watchful, to keep them aware. It was there to, to whip them into shape. I hear this noise, and all, that, all of a sudden they, they respond. And the idea is this. If we're not watching out, and if we're not being aware, if we fall asleep at the switch, so to speak, uh, we're going to allow sin to creep into our life. 
We're going to allow Satan maybe to have the reins is what we talked about. And we've got to make sure that we're always aware of when, when, uh, when the sin might want to creep in and take us off the path and, uh, and take us away from Jesus. And so, uh, so we use these illustrations this week, and I, I hope they were helpful because these are some of the, the key fundamentals of the Christian life. And uh, we use this idea of a stampede. A stampede, I, um, of course, some of the kids maybe didn't know what this was, but you know, in, in cowboy terms, this is, a, you know, this is like a panicked rush of horses or a herd of cattle or other animals that start off in some direction. But you know, there's another definition for stampede, and that is this. It's a mass movement of people at a common impulse. It's a mass movement of people at a common impulse. And I got to thinking, when you think about the gospel stampede, something that we're, we're talking about, the good news of the gospel that we find in the, God's Word, really isn't this what the Bible wants us to have and to be as Christians? He wants us to be so consumed and so taken with the gospel and so, so urgently ready to share it with others that really we become a mass movement of people <laughs> that have this common impulse to share the gospel with those around us. And I want us to talk about some of the, the principles of that tonight, th this morning from Romans chapter 10 of what we've already read. Now, this is Paul writing to the church in Rome, and one of the things that he's talking about is the difference between the Jewish people who had the Old Testament and the, the, the Gentile or the Greek people, he sometimes refers to them to, that... Uh, that were incorporated now into the church at Rome. And, uh, and so some of this, uh, this background is here, and he starts in verse 5. He says, Moses, we all know the story of Moses, he described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. You see, Moses was the, the great lawgiver. He was not just the guy that Charlton Heston portrayed on the Ten Commandments, right? He, he was someone who was greatly used of God, and he didn't, we don't just know him for part in the Red Sea. The, the great thing that the Jewish people knew about Moses was God spoke to him up on Mount Sinai, and he came down with the two tablets of stone that God had written the Ten Commandments on that we, we talk about we, until they got taken, at least. They were in our courtrooms, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not covet. You, can, you probably know most of them. Uh, and these were the Ten Commandments. But God also gave them the rest of the law. The rest of what we find in, in the Old Testament. You find it in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and, and some of those early books in the, uh, in the Old Testament. And, um, you know, the, the point that Paul is trying to make here is if, if you're going to live by the law... If you're going to try to live by the Ten Commandments, you're going to fail at it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we, we try to only remember the ones of the Ten Commandments that we're good at, right? You know, oh, well, I've never murdered anyone, so I'm, I'm good, right? And then we think about, oh, but yeah, there is one about lying, and there is one about honoring your parents. Oh, there is one about putting something else before the Lord in your life, and, and there's all, oh, well, I'll just forget about those. We'll just concentrate on the ones that I'm good at, right? Uh, the fact is, what's, what's Paul saying? He's saying, you folks, you Jewish folks, they, they, they know, he says, those, the man that doeth those things shall live by them. There was a penalty associated with breaking the law of the Old Testament. And really, the penalty was, in most cases, death. And that's really what the law was meant to help emphasize, that we as human beings cannot ultimately be as holy as God is. And, and that's what God requires. The problem is, the, the, the good news, the gospel, the, the, by the way, the word gospel just means good news. And from the Bible's perspective, there is good news in Jesus Christ. But for us to understand the good news or the gospel, we also have to understand the bad news. <laughs> because you can't have good news unless you've already got some bad news that, that, you've, uh, that you've got wiped away because of the good news. And that's really where Paul starts for us. He says... The, the, the bad news is this. God is holy. God is perfect. God doesn't have sin. And he gave us the law to tell us what God's perfection would require of us. And you know what? The Jews, anyone who's ever tried to live the Ten Commandments throughout the, the course of history has found out 
we have failed miserably <laughs> at trying to live according to the law. And what Romans 3.20, we won't turn back to it, Paul says, it's by the law is the knowledge of sin. Do you realize that if there was no law, we wouldn't know that we were breaking the law, right? If you go down the road and somebody removes all the speed limit signs, which I hope someone does someday, but uh, <laughs> then I can drive as fast as I want down the road, right? <laughs> and there's nobody to tell me I can't because there's no law, right? <laughs> but as soon as someone puts up the sign and says, this is the speed limit and my needle's going a little fast for that, then I have officially broken the law, right? And so the law of the Old Testament is there to help define for us what it is that makes sin and what doesn't. And so, uh, and so by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what Paul says. And the fact is, if we are honest, we all can admit to the fact that none of us are perfect, that everyone has broken the law in some way, and that nobody can keep those commandments. Everyone has sinned. Uh, Romans 3.23 tells us, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, this seems like a lot of bad news. <laughs> because the fact is, God can't have a relationship with a sinful human being. <laughs> because we would, by nature, just corrupt His holiness. We could not stand in His presence. Because He's perfect and He's holy. But the good news is, God does want a relationship with us. And so... He, uh, Paul addresses first these beliefs of the Jews that they believe somehow they could just be good enough. They believe somehow that they could just make it. They could, they, could, they could get all of the things that they need to do and God would somehow accept them. And you know, it's not so foreign for us today to have that same feeling. It's not so, not so hard for us to say, well, you know, I live by the golden rule. I do unto others as I'd have them do unto me. And you know, as long as I'm a good person, I think God's going to accept me. And you know, if God worked by those rules, I think he probably would. <laughs> but the problem is, our goodness, the Bible says, the best that we have, our righteousness, God says, is like filthy rags. <laughs> so he says, even the best of the best of us are not even close to being good to the goodness of God. And that's what the trouble is that comes to us. And Paul is trying to address this with the Jews. The Jews said, well, we have the Old Testament. We believe the Old Testament. We're trying to follow the law. We, we knew, they, knew that, they, they knew that there was going to be a Messiah coming. They knew that their God was sending someone to, to give them the ultimate redemption they needed. But the fact was they believed there was some sense in which God was going to accept them for just being good. And that's the same problem that we have today. Until we realize that we have sin and that God can't live with our sin, we don't know that we need a Savior. We don't know that we need the gospel. We don't know that we need the good news. And so we see Paul continues in verses 6 and 7. He says, this is how you Jews live. You have to live by these things that are part of the law. But in verses 6 and 7, he says, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down for above, from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. You see, somewhere even in the Old Testament, the Jews that really had studied it and known it, they recognized that they were going to need something greater than themselves. They were going to need someone for God to send and ultimately pay that perfect sacrifice. The Jews were used to sacrificing lambs in the temple to be able to cover people for, from their sins and, and, and manage their sins this way. But they knew the Old Testament pointed to this one that was coming who would be the perfect sacrifice for sin. And so what does he say? He says, you can't just keep asking yourself, when's he coming? Where's he at? When's he going to come down from heaven? When's he going to rise from the dead? Because Paul says, it's already happened. This is what Paul's getting at here in verses 6 and 7. And the fact is, he says in verse, um, verse 8, this is what he says. What saith it? The word is nigh thee. He says, it's right here. He says, I'm telling you it. It's right near to you right now. It's even in your mouth. It's in your heart. And that is a word of faith which we preach. He says, instead of following works, 
you're going to have to have a faith in someone greater than the works that you have. And that faith is in this Messiah, this one that's going to come and be the ultimate redemption for you. And so what does he say? Here's how this faith works. He says, if, verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So Paul's saying, you know, instead of trusting in all those good things that you think you're doing, which they are good, he says, what we need to trust instead is the goodness that Jesus Christ has done. <laughs> because Jesus Christ, what it tells us in the Bible is he lived a perfect life. He was born perfect and he never did a thing wrong. He was sinless. And when he went to the cross, we all know that Jesus died on the cross. Every, everybody deals with the Bible. That's one of the first things you learn. He, he was punished and he suffered and he died because of our sin. He didn't deserve any of it. He wasn't guilty of anything. But he chose to go and die on the behalf of people who deserve to die. The Bible says the wages of sin, Romans 6, 23, the wages or the payment that we deserve for sin is death. But it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, it's important to know that what Paul just told us is that we have to begin with belief and faith in our heart in what Christ has done for us. And how do we do that? He says... We have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, what he's done for you. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says, uses this word saved. Thou shalt be saved. What are you saved from? Well, you're saved from the punishment you deserve for the sin that you're living in. You're saved from an eternity of hell. Hell is a real place. Hell is a place of eternal torment. It's a place of eternal separation from God. And it's a terrible place. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. And we certainly, uh, you know, don't like to dwell on it. <laughs> but the fact is, it's a true thing. And the more we understand there's a reality of hell for those that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, the more we realize the gospel is such good news. <laughs> because the good news is this. We don't have to do anything. <laughs> Christ has done it all. And all we have to do is simply confess that Jesus Christ died for me. Confess that I'm a sinner and that I need salvation through Jesus Christ. He says, and believe that God has raised him from the dead. The Bible says you shall be saved because the Bible says it's with our heart that we can believe unto righteousness. We want to find righteousness that's greater than ours. It starts with belief in what Christ has done. The heart believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And you know what makes the news especially good? Is verse 13. Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says it doesn't matter what background you've come from. It doesn't matter whether you grew up going to church. It doesn't matter... Uh, whether you had a, a, a good home life or you didn't. It doesn't matter whether you've got the world by its tail or the world stomping all over your life right now. It doesn't matter what race you're from. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter. The whosoever in this verse covers everyone. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for every human being that ever did live and ever will live on the face of this earth. And that is good news. That's the gospel. And the fact is, just like we talked about the first night with that branding iron, <laughs> we're either going to go through life being identified with Christ because we've put our faith in him, or we're going to run loose and free and wild and think we've got it figured out like those wild stallions that are out in the open country. But you know what? In the end, most of those wild stallions end up sick and dead and uncared for and not finding enough water, and they end up in very bad shape. The fact is, we need to be identified with Christ, 
And the good news is, there's none of us that needs to leave here today without knowing that. Because we can trust Him just by simply believing in what He's done for us. But Paul goes further than that. He says, we all need the gospel. But then he talks about the fact that really, the gospel needs a stampede. Not just that we need it, but the gospel needs a stampede. Let's look at verse 14. Verse 14, Paul begins with this line of logic, and he says, Now, I've talked about whosoever shall call on the Lord shall be saved, and then he says, but there's a problem. (laughs) Verse 14, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they, they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Do you see what Paul is building to here? The fact of the matter is, there's some of us maybe sitting here today and you say, boy, I've accepted Christ. I know him as my Savior. I I believe I'm a Christian. I believe that Christ died for me. I put my faith in him. I've confessed him. I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to spend an eternity in hell. I'm sure of that fact because the Bible told me so, and my faith has been in Jesus Christ. And that's great. That's good news for you. But what about the good news that other people need to hear? (laughs) Because if you have good news, do you just want to keep it to yourself? (laughs) This is what Paul's saying. He says, how are other people going to call on him in whom they have not believed. There's plenty of people that have never heard this truth. And there's people everywhere, this whosoever, that need to call on Jesus Christ to be saved. But the fact is, they don't have a belief in Christ. They don't even have a knowledge of Christ. There's so many people, people even in our society, in our circles of influence, in our region, right here in central Pennsylvania, that simply don't know the truth about what Christ has done about what the Bible really says. And the fact is, we say, well, we've got plenty of Bibles. Go down to Ollie's, you can get them for two bucks a piece. I mean, (laughs) go read it for yourself, right? (laughs) No, that's not what Paul says. He doesn't say, let's start selling Bibles cheap and have everybody get the message. Now, some people do get the message because they open the Bible and they find the truth for themselves. But the fact is, Paul says, how are they going to call on them who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? You see what he's saying? Reading is one thing, but hearing is another. It's something else for you to be able to go to someone else and you say, you know, I, I used to believe that I was good enough to get to heaven. Or I used to believe that I could just live my life how I wanted and who knows what's going to happen when it all is over. (laughs) But I determined at some point, someone came and showed me that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I accepted him. And you know what? That's changed my life. You can find people all through this auditorium, all through your life, who could give you a testimony of how Knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior has changed them. Changed them from the inside out. And ultimately, isn't that the best thing to hear from someone else? How Jesus Christ has changed you? Do you know why when they put commercials on, they hire these actors to come up and say, Well, I use this special product, and if you do it too, it'll work for you. You know? And then at the bottom it says, this person is a paid sponsor of this or this, uh, this thing. You know that guy's never tried that stuff, right? Whatever it is. He's never fed his dog that dog food. He's never put that in his hair. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> People could tell if you're a phony baloney with it, right? <laughs> what do we need as Christians? We need people to say... I'm genuinely through and through a different person because of my faith in Jesus Christ. The good news has changed my life, and the gospel can change yours too. That's what we need. We need people who get excited about telling others about the truth of the gospel. And the sad truth is, the truth of the gospel today has often become muddied. (laughs) Well, you know, it's, uh, well, I thank God. Or, or let's just talk about 
you know, religion in general terms, or let's just talk about, you know, church, and let's, let's all be religious. Well, the religion's not going to save you. <laughs> Coming to church is not going to make you good enough. <laughs> Putting some money in the offering box is not going to make you any more righteous. <laughs> the only thing that brings us to the righteousness that God requires is the faith that we need in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, how are we going to believe in him in whom we've not heard? And how shall they hear, verse 14, again, without a preacher? Now you say, boy, I'm glad for this verse because it really gets me off the hook. Do you know that the preacher there is not talking about this preacher up here? <laughs> no, the preacher in that verse is talking about the person who goes and shares the gospel with someone else. It's the one who's ready to share God's truth. It's anyone Anyone who's come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the fact is, everyone who knows Christ and has gotten this good news for themselves should be telling someone else about Him. And verse 15 says, How shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Do you know what the Lord thinks about you when you get busy about sharing the truth of the gospel with other people. He says, boy, your feet are beautiful. <laughs> he says, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This is something that pleases the Lord for us to do. Because ultimately, the truth is that we see in verse 17 is this. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, the fact is, many of us have Bibles in our homes. Many of us have Bibles everywhere. Like, like I said, you can get them at Ollie's. <laughs> but most of us don't spend the time in our Bible that we need. We, we, like, to, we like to see what, uh, what, the, what the, maybe the Christian broadcasting channel has to say. Or maybe we read a daily bread every day, or maybe we, we, uh, we do some other things. But the fact is, how many of us truly know God's Word? The only thing that the Bible claims about itself is this. It is truth. Not that it just contains truth. Not that you can just discern truth from it. But the Bible says this. If you want to get truth in your life, you want to be transformed, you're going to have to get into God's Word. And it's going to have to be stored in your heart, and it's going to ultimately come out in your life, in how you live, in how you speak, and how you act with others. And that is what the Bible says. That's why it says, faith cometh by hearing. We have to have something to be able to tell other people, but it says hearing comes by the Word of God. In other words, what we go to speak to others with the truth of the gospel has to be grounded in what the Bible tells us. It can't just be our opinion. It can't just be uh, some, you know, religious prayer that we heard. It, can't. it has to be the truth that we find here. And only when we proclaim God's truth will lives be transformed. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter... I'm in the wrong direction here. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. It says this, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we get to know God's word, our hearts and minds will be changed. We will be transformed into something that we weren't before. Because God's words will settle in and it will make a difference. And the fact is, the Christian church in America today, and maybe lots of other parts of the world, even the churches that are trying to teach God's Word, oftentimes as Christians, we aren't, we accept it, it's part of who we are, but we don't actually get out and share it with others like we should. If you think about this picture of a stampede, you can all, you can all picture it, right? <laughs> when those cattle get spooked or those cattle get, you know, going off in a different direction, and it's just, you hear this rumble of thunder, right? As the hooves go down, and they start going off in all directions, and the dust gets kicked up, and you say, what are we going to do now? It's almost like an avalanche, right? 
It's like, it's not going to get stopped. <laughs> How are you going to stop a stampede? It's overwhelming. This is what God wants for the gospel. He wants us to get so excited. He wants us to get our feet on the ground. He wants us to get that good news that has transformed our life out in front of those around us. And he wants it to become an avalanche of truth that cannot be stopped. What would our church be today? Not just our church, but our church in, in the world, our church in this country be today if those of us who knew the gospel, who knew the transforming power of Jesus Christ, would actually get out and be part of a stampede. It would be a different place. The Bible still works. God's truth hasn't changed. And the righteousness of Jesus Christ can still be for those, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.